Chapter 15 is the psychopathology of everyday schooling. None of the familiar school sequences, none of them, are defensible by any of the known rules of evidence. You could not bring a case to court that this has to be this way or the division into social studies and so on has to be that way. They're quite indefensible. They're all arbitrary, because you have to do something as long as you're going to confine these kids. They're all grounded in superstition or class propaganda or aesthetic or philosophical prejudices of one sort or another. For instance, and this I think will be directly useful to you if you're a, if you're a homeschooler, Pestalozzi's famous formula of simple to complex is a prescription for disaster in the classroom. This is not the way people learn. They learn from a kind of random selection up and down the ladder that keeps them feeling the zest of the chase. And sometimes, very often, you can reverse the ladder, and it works just as well. In fact, there were famous experiments. I have to tell you this. I hope I can remember the name. If I can, it was Penn State University in central Pennsylvania. And the years, I believe, were the middle 70s. Uh, I'm reaching, but this old mind. But these are quite famous experiments. The Pennsylvania State University Psych Department took the physics textbook for freshman physics, which I believe was a required course so that all freshmen had to take it. And they scrambled the pages at random, mind you. So often you'd get to the end of a page and you'd be on a different concept in the middle of a sentence, the former concept. And they applied that. This is some more evidence of the way schools are used as laboratories of experimentation. They applied that to a few sections of the freshman physics course, and everybody else got the regular, careful, simple to complex ladder system. On the standardized examinations that measured supposedly proficiency in physics knowledge, there was no difference at all between the group that got a textbook that was made up of pages that had just been put together at random versus the ones who had the scientifically organized and, and a rational thing. But I had too much experience with kids. And I had too much bad experience with simple to complex in my own life and also my teaching career, not to say, you're nuts if you buy that build. Uh, the last part of the book is called The Prison of Modern Schooling. And chapter 16, I believe there's 18 chapters in my book, so we're near the end. Yes. Chapter 16 is called A Conspiracy Against Ourselves. Spare yourself the anxiety of thinking of this school thing as a conspiracy, even though the project is riddled with petty conspirators. It was and is a fully rational transaction in which all of us play a voluntary part. That is, you can step off this treadmill at any moment you want and actually do this education thing the right way. You can just step off the treadmill and, and walk away. It was and is a fully rational transaction action and you play a voluntary part in it. You trade the liberty of your kids, as all of us trade our free will, for a stable social order and a prosperous economy. Now I want to modify that a little bit. We had a prosperous economy in every single phase of American history. It's just that the corporate economy 
is much more prosperous than the economy of independent livelihoods, which is to say more stuff is available and more legal tender to buy the stuff with is available under the corporate system. The cost is your mind and your character to have that extra bit of stuff. Uh, the society is much more stable than it would be because no one knows how to rock the boat or very few people know how to rock the boat there. And when you look in earlier periods of American society, it was always turbulent because it was supposed to be turbulent. That's what they failed to tell you in social studies, that the whole American charter is meant to provoke constant argument. It's meant to make doing anything that changes the past difficult to do. It's a test of whether it's really worth doing that we make it so hard to do. For the Supreme Court to cooperate with the White House, to cooperate with both houses of Congress, is a nightmare. That's exactly what we fled when we came here. Of course, you can't argue very effectively unless your mind is developed and your understanding and your insight, unless you can speak in public and write in public. That's why we don't bother to let you know how to do those things, even though they're child's play to do. Because then you'd be able to argue effectively. You would restore the America of Andrew Jackson. Who wants that? Not Unilever, I can tell you. Not Coca-Cola, I can tell you. Not General Dynamics, I can tell you. Why would they want that kind of competition, that kind of obstructionism? So it's a conspiracy against ourselves. You and I have entered into a devil's bargain in which most of us agree to live our lives through as children. We may be a little bit less childish than the actual children, but not much. The self-same tutelage which freezes the young into place in exchange for food, entertainment, safety, political simplification affects both the grown-ups here and the adults. The contract fixes the goal of human life so low that students go mad trying to escape it. Of course, the struggles are largely over by the end of the teen years. That has nothing to do with the claims of hormones and biology. It's the light that goes out of your eyes or goes out of your house pet's eyes when it realizes that it's never going to be allowed to go out into the world.